Hey everybody, uh, so welcome to another teardown. Uh, just want to say first before I get started, uh, I hope you all had a, a good new year and um, a good holiday. Um, I certainly did and I'm um, looking forward to 2016. Right, so let's have a look at uh, what we've got to tear down today. So as I mentioned in my video that I made just before um, the Christmas holidays, um, I've picked up this particular unit. It's called a Genepix 4000B. Um, it's manufactured by Axon Instruments and it's a microarray scanner. Now when I first uh, um, heard of this I, I was complete, completely none the wiser. Um, I had to do a bit of googling to find out what it actually does. Now before I get into all of that detail um, I have actually tried to get this working um, because I always like to try and power things on and see how they work. It some, can sometimes help a little bit and it, and it seeing things in a working operation is always a bit more interesting. So I did try and get this working. Um, it was a bit of a problem to start off with because I didn't get a power supply with this and it comes with um, a fairly fairly obscure power supply. Um, I could have bought one um, second hand but they were like $60 or something and I didn't want to expend a lot of money on this anyway. So um, I had to cobble around with um, chopping the power connector off and connect it up to my power supplies. I found one of the power supply rails was shorted out, so that's probably why it's been um, sent into recycling. Um, I've tried to fix it. I found one um, IC which was which was shorted out, but um, it turns out that wasn't the only part. So at that point, I got to thinking, well, I really can't be asked doing anything more with it. So. Um, it does mean that this can be torn down completely uh, right to its component parts, which I'm sure should, uh, many of you will enjoy that. Um, if I did get it working, I might have thought about repurposing it into um, some kind of high resolution scanner. Um, but nope, I'm just going to take it apart. So this dates from around about 2001, uh, so it's getting on for 15 years old. Um, as I said, it's a microarray scanner, um, which is used in um, DNA and gene analysis. Um, original cost when it was new, I think I've seen reports that it cost about twenty-four thousand uh, dollars, which is <laughs> not an insignificant amount. Um, I believe that probably came with a um, a computer alongside it um, because it communicates with um, SCSI. There's nothing on the actual machine that you can actually operate yourself. It's all done with software. And uh, obviously, uh, I received this unit. Just It was just the box. I didn't get any any cables. As I said, I was missing the power supply. And obviously, I didn't get any any of the computer that went with it as well. So it was literally just, um, just the box on its own. Right, so uh, what the hell is um, a microarray scanner? Well, it's used in... Um, gene and DNA analysis. I'm not really going to go into much detail because obviously I had to do a bit of googling around to find out what this was all about and um, felt a bit like I was uh, disappearing into uh, Alice in Wonderland. It was a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, I got to a certain point and went well I'm not really going to go much further here so I just got the basic ideas of what uh, what the physical machine does um, and left it there. If anybody wants to go up and uh, read about uh, this kind of thing then uh, just google for um, microarray scanning and um, you'll find lots of information. So what this actually does from a, a basic point of view it's um, a number of uh, samples are placed onto a microscope slide well it, they don't actually use microscope slides they are special slides they just happen to be the same size as microscope slides and um, a machine will print many hundreds of uh, samples onto the slide in a, an array. Um, each one uh, is a small little dot. They also contain two fluorescent markers. One responds to red light and one responds to green. And those markers bond to particular things you're looking for. It's, it's this kind of detail that uh, I'm not really going to go into because it's way complicated. Um, so basically what you're looking for is um, the response from two fluorescent markers. Um, the samples are placed in a in an array on the slide and a laser or two lasers, red and green, scan across and the um, light which is uh, fluoresces out of the uh, the samples is picked up 
and um, sent to a photo multiplier and an image is created based on that. Um, and then on the image that you get on your software, you can then do analysis on which markers are more prominent in different samples and things like that. So given that the um, scanning resolution is so high, the mechanical and optical uh, properties of this are pretty, um, the tolerances are pretty tight. Um, you'll see when I start looking at it, it is pretty well built. Um, it's obviously built to last and um, spared, they spared no expense. So if we have a quick look around the unit, uh, we, the case is really, really thick um, plastic. Um, it's very heavy. Um, the entire unit is probably getting on for about 13, 14 kilos at a guess. Um, so it's not a light unit. Um, there's no user controls on it. There's not even a power switch. Um, the only indicator you have are, are these ones on top, which is a just a simple power power light, um, an active light, and um, I think that one means that scanning is complete light. So we've got a small air vent at the back. Uh, we have this sliding door here. Um, <laughs> even the um, the sliders on this are actually pretty uh, pretty high quality, just for the uh, the sliding cover. So in here we have the um, the actual holder for the uh, the microarray slide. Um, this moves in and out um, on a um, a sliding uh, a sliding table. So to load the slide, um, this would be moved out to round about here somewhere where you can actually open this this door and actually place the slide inside. And if we just have a quick look at the back there, we've got a small little uh, ventilation fan. This is where the power socket used to go. Obviously I've uh, taken that off when I was trying to get get this to work. We've got um, a, a SCSI 2 connector, a SCSI ID selection and a couple of ports there which are unused. Now uh, when I first picked this item up, um, I uh, so I want to try and get it working. So to take the lid off, there's actually uh, just four screws right on the on the base. Uh, but when I uh, took those out, I actually couldn't get the lid off um, because this um, loading tray was actually out all the way to here, and it meant it was physically impossible to take the uh, take the lid off it. So what it meant, um, I was cursing and swearing at it for a good while, um, and then I realised that. Um, if you uh, open up the back, I could just manage to tilt this this forward a little bit, and it allowed me to get my th finger inside and actually turn this stepper motor from the back, which allowed me to move this very very slowly backwards to allow me to take the lid off. Which uh, it was a bit frustrating. I, I, I thought I was going to have to uh, hacksaw the the case apart, but um, thankfully I didn't. Presumably in the software, there's probably some option to. Uh, to set the, the tray in or out, depending on um, whether it needs to be serviced or, or something like that, maybe. Right, so if we just um, lift the top off this. So inside the uh, the lid, we've got, uh, we've got the door mechanism there. We've got the connectors for the LEDs and there's a small sensor there to uh, so the the controller board can actually sense when you actually open the door um, I should say this is um, this is really really thick plastic I mean that must be about, about seven millimeters thick and it's black on the inside uh, presuming to stop um, any light bouncing around because this is this is using photo multipliers so it does need to be reasonably dark in here so if we have a look around the inside, uh, everything from here upwards uh, is all mounted on this large um, aluminium uh, plate. Um, it's about 17 millimetres thick. It's obviously been beautifully machined and finished off. Um, so that's really solid. Um, right in the centre we have the one of the axes. This is a, uh, a movable arm, which is on a linear, linear actuator with a, uh, a stepper motor, so that moves in one direction we have the the actual place where you you put the slides in and for the other axis we have a, a voice coil um, which allows a uh, another linear arm to uh, to move backwards and forwards given that this works down to five microns then I would imagine the tolerances on 
uh, both these axes are going to be um, quite amazing, I would have thought. Uh, these things certainly wouldn't have been cheap. So we have the uh, magnets and the voice coil just there for that. Um, this um, seems to be a, a controller for one of the lasers. So that's just mounted there with the wires running around to the other side. Uh, we have at the back here a stepper motor. I'm not entirely sure what that's for, um, but uh, we shall find out later. Uh, we have the stepper motor for the for this axis. Um, we have a large optical assembly here with uh, a big aluminium enclosure around it. Everything's here is uh, bolted together with these huge, great big Allen bolts. Um, everything's really, really thick aluminium. It was really designed never ever to flex or move. So that seems to be part of the optical optical assembly. We have a, another plate here and a small PCB board on the side here. Uh, we can see in here some of the optical optical paths. Um, this small board here um, has a large ribbon cable which runs down into the base of the unit. Um, there's various um, connectors running off to different bits. Hopefully you can see both the lasers. We have uh, this larger one here and a small one just down, down below. Um, the one on the bottom is a red laser. Um, that seems to be um, just a, a plain red diode laser, solid state laser. Um, that is um, 635 nanometers. And this laser here, uh, which is a green one, that is uh, 532 nanometers. Uh, we can see two optical paths here. We have um, the green one comes um, through this um, small wheel, as you can see here. There seems to be, um, in one position, there is um, nothing in there. Then on the second position, we have a small filter and then another filter on the third position. Um, that comes through a small little um, gap with uh, what seems to be a partially reflective uh, mirror. I think what that is doing is that the laser comes through this path here, hits this partial mirror and then bounces part of the light up onto this this sensor here. So that's probably just a um, a sensor just to detect when the laser is actually the laser is actually on. Um, that comes out onto a small mirror. Um, these mirrors um, are on a um, an adjustable position uh, with which is spring loaded as well so uh, that's all adjustable in three axes so um, that bounces the beam up to this um, mirror here which is another one on a similar sort of mounting um, you can actually also see that um, there is no uh, filter wheel um, on the laser at the bottom here um, that's the red laser um, there's no filter wheel there at all so um, there's obviously something happening with uh, particularly the green laser. Um, I would speculate, um, having read the, the user guide a little bit, it does mention that the the laser power is adjustable between 100%, um, um, 30, sorry, 66%, 33% and 10%. Now, what I think is actually happening, the, the red laser, I think, is adjustable um, electrically um, through the connections, you can actually control the power of the laser. But I think on the green one, um, that is always running at full power. Um, so I think what they've done is they've added a, a mechanical filter, which they can just bring into the beam to reduce the uh, the power down to match. Uh, we've got two high voltage power supplies here. Um, these are Matsusada Precision Incorporated. Um, well, they're actually Japanese. They go are adjustable between uh, zero and a thousand volts. So I would um, bet any money that uh, each one of those is to run the photo multipliers, which generally run between uh, about 700 and, and several thousand volts, depending on the uh, the actual photo multiplier. So um, thousand volt power supplies, um, most likely for the photo multipliers. There's um, some adjustment pots here. Um, given there's two of those, I would imagine these are for adjusting the uh, the output voltage of those. Uh, not a huge amount to see on there. There's um, a custom a custom ASIC down there. I'm not sure what that is. 
and we can just see um, these black things here zoom in a little bit um, those have hamamatsu written on them that is a small um, adapter which will contain the resistor dyno chain voltage dividers um, to uh, to drop the voltages to each of the dynodes in the photomultiplier and there is actually another one of those around the corner here behind this cable but I can't quite so if we have a, a little look at some more of the optics so the um, the beam actually came up to uh, this mirror here which actually reflects it through um, this base plate there's a small hole which is just down underneath this flap this flap is a mechanical interlock um, to block the laser when you open the the door on the uh, on the actual case so there's a mechanical interlock there there is also uh, an electrical um, interlock as well so I would imagine that's just a uh, like a double safe safe thing um, that uh, allows the beam to come through onto this mirror here now we probably won't really be able to see this until I take it apart properly but um, it is actually a partial mirror it allows the beam through the center of it um, so the beam would come through and then hit this small mirror which is on the the actual scanning arm which reflects the beam up and through this small lens which then um, projects onto the actual slide itself. So what would uh, what would actually happen is the uh, the light would come out of this, um, hit the um, the actual samples. Um, some will emit some kind of fluorescent light back, which is then reflected back through that on the mirror and then onto this mirror, which then bounces the light into the actual sensor assembly. And we can see here the actual um, loading mechanism where the uh, the micro array, micro array slide actually sits just in there, and then it's clamped down with this. Now this is um, the the quality on the machining of this all this aluminium is actually um, it's really really impressive. Um, it's they certainly spared no expense when they made this. I tell you, um, you can see more adjustment spots here. These are small Allen screws which allow this base to to actually move around slightly there we go so um, that uh, obviously needs to be really precisely aligned and here we have the the actual um, arm which does the scanning of, of the actual laser beam um, this is uh, a voice coil and so this works very much like a speaker um, as you apply uh, an electric current through that it would actually move this from side to side it is a bit of a shame I couldn't actually get this working because this is one of the few things I actually wanted to see. Um, I wanted to see how fast this actually worked. Um, I suspect it's going to be pretty fast actually, um, given that the amount of scanning it's going to have to do over an entire slide. Um, I think this might have been going reasonably quickly. Um, so we've got uh, two magnets, uh, one on the top and one on the bottom. They seem to be um, some kind of ceramic so uh, you can see the connections for the voice coil just here on this little flat flex which just allows it to move in and out. So if we move a little bit further around you'll have to excuse the messiness of these wires. I did actually have to cut the, um, the cable ties which were holding them down when I was trying to, trying to repair this. Um, we have a connector for the uh, sensors and LEDs on the case. Um, we have uh, this unit here, this is, uh, seems to be the controller and power supply for the green DPSS laser. Um, we can just see some of the rather substantial mounting um, points for the, um, the X direction. Um, this is not manufactured by Axon Technologies, it's actually made by New England Affiliated Technologies. Um, has a serial number. 36816 um, so obviously this has been bought in as a precision actuator and there's a, a stepper motor on the back here which just provides the position right so what we'll do now we'll just um, um, unbolt the uh, main part of this and then lift it out of the uh, the base so we can actually have a look at the brains on the inside
right, so we just got the uh, the main assembly here. Uh, you can see now the um, the the two lasers. That's the red one, and the green one just there, and uh, the optical paths there for them. Um, underneath, there's very little. There's just a uh, this stepper motor is uh, just covered by this piece of metal here that has a belt drive. Right, so in here we've got the two main uh, PCBs which uh, run the whole show. Um, we've got uh, that is the the power connector that uh, I disconnected. So the main power runs into this connector here, which supplies power to both the top and bottom board. Um, they are connected together with a few um, pin headers placed in uh, a couple of places around the PCB, which. Uh, you just pull it, pull it off, and um, that disconnects those. Um, on this top board, uh, we've got a number of adjustment uh, adjustment pots. Uh, we've got um, an Altera Max um, EPM nine three two zero ALC eighty four, and we have uh, these devices here. These are um, National uh, LMD eighteen two hundred T. These are H bridges, so I would uh, hazard a guess that those are driving the uh, the two stepper motor drive stepper motors. Um, we've got a number of ICs here. Um, these I suspect are running the voice coil for the um, um, the little linear actuator thing. Um, this one, which runs over here. I'm oh, sorry, this one here. Um, there's a couple of big inductors there. So I suspect this bit here is is driving the um, that uh, voice coil, and uh, these are driving the the two stepper motors. Uh, we've got a connection over to that uh, small fan in the corner. Um, this was where the the main the optical assembly plugged in. Um, we've got a whole load of uh, Burr Brown devices. Um, these um, devices here, there's quite a few of those, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, those are all Burr Brown um, IVC 102s which are integrating amplifiers. I've just removed, uh, there's only four screws holding this in so I've just removed those out. This should So not much on the on, on the underneath. Now uh, I mentioned earlier that I actually tried to repair this. Um, I actually found one of these um, these H bridges to be um, one of the outputs was shorted. Um, so it's actually this one here that I replaced. But uh, unfortunately, there's um, there's some other device gone shorted um, elsewhere, and uh, I didn't really want to go any further. Um, I didn't pay a lot for this, I only paid £30 for the whole thing, so um, I wasn't going to go and sp keep spending money to try and get it working, considering I don't really have a use for it. So I'm just going to take this board out as well, uh, just to make it a little bit easier to uh, have a look at. Uh, so in the base there we've just got an um, a aluminium tray which everything mounts in. Okay, let's take a quick look at the uh, main processing board. Um, it looks like this is more um, of sort of data processing, whereas the other board, this one, um, seems to be more controlling the uh, the actual hardware. Uh, we've got uh, the got two connectors up at the back. This was um, not actually plugged into anything, um, and this one here is the SCSI uh, interface. Um, just next to this one, there is actually a Max 202 CPE here. Um, so that probably means there's an RS-232 port, serial port on, on there, but um, that was actually unused and not accessible unless you had the box open. Um, we've got a jumper just there, no idea what that is for. Um, this connector was for the SCSI ID, which went over onto the back panel. Um, these various pin headers um, are used to um, connect to the the upper board why they've got um, three three different types of uh, connector on there I have no idea why I couldn't just use one or at least one type anyway um, next to the SCSI controller we have a, an LSI um, 
device that is actually a, a SCSI controller, it's hardly surprising. Um, next to that we have an Altera Flex FPGA. Um, we've got uh, what is probably a, um, a flash ROM just there. This device here which is a National NS5018AL that is a UART. An oscillator there that's 1.8 4 megahertz and it looks like there's another smaller one just there which is probably the main clock for for the large devices and that's 40 megahertz next large device we've got uh, an IBM PowerPC that is um, a 403 GA um, which is a 32-bit risk um, embedded controller so it's not just a processor there'll be um, um, a whole lot more in there than just a normal processor. Um, these two devices here are um, SRAM, they seem to be 128k each, so you've got a little bit of RAM there to use. Um, we've got a little bit of analog stuff going on here, we've got some Burr Brown OPA devices, I think they're normally op amps, and we have a small Burr Brown PCM1702. Um, and they are um, stereo audio DACs. Um, so uh, interesting to see that in this kind of device. So that's the sort of thing you'd normally find in um, audio grade stuff. Over here we have um, an interesting outline. Um, this is actually completely outlined and there's a number of uh, unpopulated pins and it's labeled U33. But there is actually um, Everything seems to be populated with discrete components. Um, the device in the center is an LTC1608. Yep, 1608A. Um, that is a, um, well, that is the digital, sorry, analog to digital converter. That is 16 bit at 500 kilosamples per second. So I wonder whether. Um, this is obviously the main um, digitizing part. I wonder whether they, they planned that there might might have been a hybrid module actually soldered in here in, here in place of these um, discrete components, um, given that there is an outline. Uh, next to that, we have an Intersil HI3-156-5. That is a analog multiplexer. Right, I don't think there's a huge amount to see on that now. Um, let's have a look at um, the main guts of it, which is all the optical stuff. Right, I guess um, before I start taking all this to pieces, uh, people want to see the lasers on. So uh, let's just give that a quick try. Right, so we've got the uh, red laser on the bottom there, uh, which uh, comes through here and up, bounces off this mirror. And we've got the green, which goes through the, uh, the wheel at does the attenuation. Um, off this mirror here and up into um, this mirror which goes through the, the base plate. If I just uh, puff a bit of dust in the beams, yeah, you should be able to see them there. And uh, this is now looking from the, uh, the other side. So we have the, um, the sliding uh, arm here. So if I just put some dust in there, you can see the, uh, the green and red laser hitting the mirror and then going uh, straight upwards. You can't quite see the red laser because uh, it's not quite, uh, obviously green is a lot easier to see. If I close off the green, you should uh, now be able to see the red. So this is uh, how it works with the, um, the lights on, so you can actually see a little bit easier. Uh, we've got the red laser down at the bottom that comes up through this path here, bounces off a mirror just here, through um, a small hole in aperture in this, um, this metal plate, goes through this mirror because it actually has a, an opening in it, then across to the mirror that's underneath, underneath here, which you should just be able to see down there and then out through the lens just there. So you can just see the, 
the red beam just there and it also coming out you probably won't be able to see that but there you go you can just see it coming out of the lens which would shine up onto the underside of the uh, the actual slide so I'll turn the green so open that up again and you can see there so we've got red and green as this was scanning the slide this would be moving backwards and forwards um, this this area here would be moving downwards so it would slowly scan across the uh, the entire slide with of course all the light um, bouncing back into the photo multiplier optical assembly now I can also show you um, this uh, actuator working as well um, I've just got this connected up to my um, uh, function generator so I've got a um, half a hertz uh, sine wave and I am just going to turn up the voltage so you can just see it's starting to move there that's 5 volts 7 that's 10 that's 10 volts there so I increase the frequency a little bit Obviously this is just hitting its uh, end stops at the moment because um, although there is a uh, there appears to be a, um, a position sensor on here obviously I'm not using that I'm just driving it uh, um, backwards and forwards blindly so that's two hertz three ten hertz just try turning the voltage up a bit more. That's that's 20 volts. Now I believe um, that the the voice call off this runs off the um, um, the 15 volt rail on the power supply. So that's now I've just turned that down to 15 volts. So that's probably about where it was running. Eighteen hertz. Five hertz four three. So the two lasers seem to be mounted on these two um, brackets here and here, which are just uh, seem to be just Allen Allen screws. So that's the green laser module. Doesn't seem to be any branding or anything on it. I'll take off the red one. So that is the the red laser module. Seems to be uh, a filter in the front there, which is not actually part of the laser, and it is actually pointed at a slight angle as well. Uh, the label we it's uh, coherent brand. And it's model number 0222-783-00, revision A. And peak power 10 milliwatts, uh, wavelength 635 nanometers. There's another label on it as well, which 
So that's 323, three. no idea what that means. So this small control box just screws down onto, uh, onto here. Um, it looks like we've got um, power input and then the connector that goes off to the, the actual laser head. Um, we have a label on there which is B&W Tech. From the um, documentation that I've read, um, this should be about 17 milliwatts for the green and um, the 10 concurs with the, the spec that I've seen for, for the red as well. So if we just have a quick look around the back of um, the main unit, we've got um, a connector here which seems to go to some kind of sensor buried away down in here. Um, you can see the back of the stepper motor. Uh, this has a little um, rubber wheel on. That's like a harmonic dampener. You often see that on the on the crank of your car engine, something like that. Uh, I've got the connector for this stepper motor. Um, this, that's for this stepper and that one. I'm not sure where that goes. Into this, into this block just here. So I think uh, well, I'll just take off this uh, PCB here. Uh, I've got a couple of connectors for those two optical sensors that I pointed out earlier. So just disconnect those. And this runs to this motor here, which just turns that attenuation wheel for the green laser. Now I have a sneaky suspicion that this should just pull off here because the pass-through connectors should just be a push push fit onto, uh, there we go, so there we have the uh, the connectors that the photo multipliers plug into, you can just see them just in there. So it looks like there's just these two, these four um, Allen bolts here, which I think should allow me to take off this um, this panel. Okay, there we have the optical assembly. And you can see that mirror there with uh, a hole in it for the laser to come through. Right, I think I was nearly right on the focusing. Um, it's actually fixed at this end and it moves up and down at this end. I can if I, oh, it's difficult with this because it weighs a ton. Um, if I just pop my finger between the joint and actually turn this, I can just, just feel it either moving upwards or downwards. So this is uh, obviously on some kind of uh, gear which moves this this up and down to change. Obviously the axis point will be just here, so that would affect the uh, the alignment up and down here. There you go, you can just see the, the belt in there. Now this sensor down at the back here, uh, and additionally this one. This one is just here, there's an, another one which is right up on the top here. I'm not quite sure what they're for, I would suspect they're probably some kind of position sensors to, uh, to monitor the um, the vertical position of this, which is the focusing. Um, let me just take that off so you can tell what type of thing that is. Uh, it is a small piece of aluminium with a three pin device embedded into it, which says um, A22E409. Uh, now I just have spotted that there is actually something embedded in, in the actual aluminium there. Uh, I'm going to hazard a guess that that is a magnet and that was a Hall effect sensor. So yeah, definitely a magnet there. So they're just using that to sense the, uh, the vertical position. Optical. 
thing just there. Maybe you can just see this, but there's obviously um, probably a load of vertical stripes just here. There's some small dots periodically. There, 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 there. And there is also a vertical bar just down in here. So uh, I would imagine that gives you a fairly good uh, position. Oh, one last thing that I've just realised, um, of course this uh, sensor that's going into here will be for the um, the position of, uh, of this arm here, so that's obviously what that is. Um, it's probably some kind of optical encoder, probably similar to the other one. Um, and you can just see in there, I've just wound this forward a little bit, uh, the threaded gear is just inside there. And some very nice um, SKF linear bearings on there, so I, I, I would imagine this was stupidly expensive. Okay, so these are the um, beam sensors. The beam would come in, hit this, be partially reflected back onto the actual sensor. Can't really see what that is. Right, unfortunately I can't um, actually take these off, these mirror arrangements here, because they've got some weird... These are all Imperial, and my um, set of Imperial uh, Allen keys. Um, that one is too small, and the next size up is too big. So they'll have to stay on there, at least for the moment. So I think what we'll do, um, we'll just take off this... Uh, this main bit here. I've just noticed that um, the photo multipliers are just rattling around inside here, so I suspect I should have actually um, taken this off before and taken those out before I took the PCB off. But uh, no matter. sealed on I think. There we go. So just rescue these photo multipliers that are just about to fall out. Right, so these are um R6357 tubes. They are 13 millimeter uh, respond to 185 to 900 nanometers um, and are nine stage. Uh, maximum operating voltage is um, 1.2 kV. So, right, if we take a look at this uh, optical block, um, there's a, it's just a huge, great big chunk, chunk of uh, machined aluminium. Uh, we've got two holes in here where, where the photomultipliers went. So. Oh, I think what's going to be happening in here is it's going to be the um, red and green is going to come in uh, and then be split and then one will sense green, one will sense the red. So this should be fairly simple in here, I would have thought. Um, this this assembly looks like it's just bolts onto the front and that bit is just bolted through at the back. Uh, not a huge amount to see down there, it's just a tube with a uh, slightly angled flat glass which looks like it's got some kind of uh, anti-reflection or some kind of filter on it. Yeah, there's, there's definitely, it's definitely a filter. Is that a lens as well? That looks like a lens. Yeah, there's a, actually yeah, there's a lens in there. And that looks like a flat filter. So that just uh, comes into 
Looks like there's two apertures there. Maybe they actually come in at slightly different angles. The uh, the red and green um, reflected light. Okay, so we've got a completely sealed thing. We've got a larger opening up there and a small one there. That's just a machine piece of plastic. We got another filter, and that is a red filter. Um, if I can show my torch through it. That is very, very red. On how oh, I see, so that the red is coming in through the large hole, bounces off this, which looks like it's uh, that'll be a mirror, and then comes out this, and then is filtered, and then goes into the photo multiplier. Um, so presumably the other one just goes straight through. damage done to that filter doesn't look particularly brilliant so this presumably is green yeah it's definitely a green tinge to that yeah that just looks like a plain mirror Uh, now, of course, I should point out that the um, the reason for these filters uh, will be if there is any um, reflected light from the red channel coming into the green, then that would affect um, any of the the actual readings. So uh, that's why they have these uh, these filters on here to stop any um, cross talk between the two channels. Um, another thing I've just noticed um, while I was just starting to clear up is um, well, for one. Um, this uh, mirror here seems to have some sort of damage or deterioration on it um, but I just noticed that uh, that one seems to be coated um, differently to this one you can probably see on camera that that it looks slightly green and that one looks kind of neutral really well, I've just got this um, connected up to my uh, bench power supply I've got five volts going into it you just tie the the white wire to um, to positive and that turns the uh, laser on. You can actually also use that to modulate the laser as well. So, see there? So this is only a 10 milliwatt laser, so it's not particularly powerful. Okay, if we just have a quick look at the green laser, um, a slightly different beast. Um, we have a laser head and a controller module. Um, this has uh, the same input arrangement as the red one, so we got um, the supply wires and a modulation, um, well I think it's more of a, a TTL on or off um, control. Um, that has been hot wired on the back of this D connector, they've put, bridged some solder connections across here. Um, so you literally just stick 5 volts on there and the laser will turn on. Um, the laser head plugs in on another 9 way connector on the back. Um, now this is uh, it's got a B and W Tech um, sticker on it, but there's no other identifying marks apart from these here. Uh, but if you do a bit of googling around with B W Tech and 15 M A X, 
I have found what I believe is the full part number, which is BWTF-OEM-15M-AX, which is uh, pretty similar to this. Um, can't get a data sheet on it. Um, there doesn't seem to be any reference to it on their website, uh, maybe because it's an OEM thing, I don't know. Now I can also show you this one working as well. If I just uh, pop five volts on here, turn it on, it immediately starts to draw about 1.5, sorry, uh, 1.15 uh, amps. Um, then when the laser actually turns on, um, it's drawing about 1.7, um, and that slowly drops until uh, it gets down to about an amp, and then it sort of stabilizes there. So there we have a nice green laser. Right, so that is what um, the insides of a $24,000 microarray scanner looks like. I hope you found that interesting. If you did, hit subscribe because there's going to be more coming up like this. Um, uh, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up, that's cool. And if you've got any comments or things that I've missed that you want to mention, um, leave them in the comments. Right, thanks for watching everybody and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.